place like France, it's everywhere. It's on the seafronts, it's in the wineries, uh, it's in the old chateaus, it's in the formal gardens, it's in the cities. Uh, there's a wealth of material. I mean, I've photographed there for, what, 40 years? And you know, I could photograph there a few more lifetimes. Um, it's endless. I think if there, was, if there was one country, if I was, had to choose one country to photograph in, it probably would be France. It's, it's, I can't describe it too much. It just kind of keeps going on and on and on. There's, there's so much to photograph, so many pictures to come out of France. So, <clears throat> I think when a lot of people think of your work, they think of your Asian work, the Japanese work, the minimalism, the, 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 the sort of quiet, clean lines of, 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 of that type of landscape photography. Mm -hmm. um, it seems that with your French pictures, the other half of your photography, in a way, comes through. The influence of um, Brassai, of Sudek, of, um, of Bill Brandt in particular, which I, you don't mm -hmm. see quite so much in the, the, the Asian work and other work. Mm -hmm. um, I just wonder, A, if you agree, and B, if so, why France in particular makes you photograph in this slightly different way, and, why, and, and, and then why Japan and other places make you photograph in, in that particular way? Hmm. Uh, I truly believe we're all, you know, the, very much the products of, of, of influences, um, and I have actively emulated many other photographers. Um, I am English, uh, brought up in the north of England near Liverpool, um, so my heritage is really European, um, and all the initial influences photographically were European photographers. Mm. You've named pretty much all of them. Uh, Sudek, Brandt, uh, Ajay, uh, Stieglitz from America, but um, Giacomelli. Um, and so if I'm photographing in European, with European subject matter, uh, having come from a European heritage with European influences, uh, the images are bound to have this feeling of being European, basically. Yeah. Um, I would study uh, Joseph Sudek. I would go to Prague, and I would look for places he photographed, and why he photographed them, and how he photographed. I did the same for Bill Brandt. I went to the north of England. I photographed around Yorkshire and, and Lancashire. Um, a lot of my night photography came out of uh, Bill Brandt's work. Uh, with Eugene Age, I went to France and studied the Le Notre Gardens, uh, Paris, again, the places where he actively photographed. Uh, this was a part and part of my photographic education. Going to Asia in the uh, mid-80s was um, um, very insightful. Um, it was a whole new culture for me, the fact that, you know, the language was different, it was calligraphically different. Things seemed to read from right to left rather than left to right, you know, bottom to up. Um, there was this kind of feeling of, of, of Zen simplicity, of haiku. Um, and it's something that touched me uh, very deeply. It's something I had been doing in some ways. Some of my early photographs had a haiku feeling to them. It was, it was about suggestion rather than description. Um, so I often photographed in mist, for example. Um, going to Japan... Uh, really gave me a whole different influence. And I would say if I, if I looked at my career, there's a, kind of the first half is European and the second half is Asian. Mm. Uh, and I find more and more I've been photographing in Asia. And, you know, and then I would come back to Europe and continue photographing. And I think actually in the later images in Europe, there's a, there's a strong Asian influence, um, which is not there at the beginning of, of the career so much. See, something like this could be you know, in Hokkaido. Well, it's a very, exactly. it's graphically very, very streamlined, beautiful, just, it's about design, it's about very few elements. It has that essence mm -hmm. of haiku, basically. Haiku. Mm -hmm. very, sort of, that slightly leads me into my next question, which, which is that, you know, throughout all of your pictures, really, there, there's no, there are no people. Um, and I just wonder whether you could explain why not, essentially. Uh, hey, I don't like people. You yeah. should know that by now. <laughs> <laughs> and, also, and also in Paris, how you avoid them. <laughs> Um, I often use the analogy of the stage that, you know, I like to photograph uh, before the characters, the actors come on the stage and after they've left. I like the presence, the atmosphere that's left, the kind of the, the tension. Um, you know, we all go to, you know, concert halls, whatever, and when the, you know, when the band, the orchestra is warming up, there's a certain, there's a certain edge, uh, and we can, we can use our imagination to, 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 to kind of create scenes on the stage. And this is essentially what I like to do. I like to present a stage and invite a viewer to walk into that and create their, I mean, basically 
finish the photograph, to create their own photograph. Um, technically, how that happens with me, of course, is that I use a lot of long exposures. So even if there are people in the photograph, they, they, they disappear. Um, and I do that all the time. Sometimes I spot them out with my retouching brush <laughs> afterwards. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I just find in, 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 you know, in the Victorian age of photography, uh, figures were used essentially to give scale. Um, so they would place figures, and then we could say, oh, how big the bridge is or how big the tree is. But a lot of my work is about enigma, uh, about whether it's photographed during the day or photographed at night, you know, how big or small something is. Um, you know, it, it, and, and, and they're also, I mean, they're timeless in, in a sense that, you know, this is not 2014. This could be, you know, 1814, if photography had been created then. It's, they don't, they're not so specific. Uh, and I find that putting a figure into the photograph somehow focuses the attention uh, on that person, uh, on that scene, uh, on that time. It gives scale and perspective to the whole uh, scene, which, which doesn't interest me so much. Yeah. Interesting. Do, do, are you interested, uh, despite all of that, in narrative in, in your pictures at all? Do you find yourself interested in the story of the, of the, um, the place and, and the people that might have mm -hmm. um, inhabited it or, or, or used it? Or, or do you find yourself mostly interested in form and shape and, 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 and so on? I find that I, I, I feel I act more as a, a kind of a medium. Mm. Um, so I don't need to know the whole history of a place. Um, I mean, I have done projects where I've really studied what has happened there, but, mm. but I like to present the scene so that other people can use their own interests to come into it. I see. Yeah. Well, my favorite one. Hmm. What I want to do now is just focus on three pictures that are in mm -hmm. the show that you can all see a bit later, and you've probably all seen already, and just um, find out a bit more about them. So here, right. this is the fantastic, I'm sorry if you can't see, but this is the fantastic full moon rise in the Chalcé Islands <coughs> in France, which is the, um, the great sort of... Um, uh, trajectory of the moon um, captured on, 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 in print. Can you tell us a bit about this and how, the, how you did this and what, what the story was? Well, I mentioned that you know, many of these photographs that you see here were actually commissioned in some way, shape, or form. I've had many commissions in France to photograph specific areas. You know, sometimes I'm doing advertising. Um, you know, the Calais Lace Factories I photographed on my own, but this is, for example, from Chateau Lafitte, so they commissioned me to photograph. Um, a lot of them are. The Chauzet Islands I was commissioned by the French Coastal Commission. Um, to spend two weeks in this archipelago. Um, and Where are they in France, Michael? They're, they're, they're very close to Grandville. Uh, they're in the channel, basically. <laughs> where are they? Yeah. Then? Where are they? Yeah. <laughs> in the well, channel. They're, they're in the channel. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Go to the Guernsey Islands and keep going. Okay, right. <laughs> You'll find them. But, but it's French territory, so we don't really hear about them very much. And very few people live there. Right. Um, so it's a, this huge collection of islands that uh, at high tide disappear uh, and at low tide you can you can you can see there uh, there's a big um, uh, aquaculture there of, of, of fisheries shellfish uh, seaweed and so forth mm. um, so for this particular photograph um, I attempted it three times with two cameras each time because I use film cameras I don't do digital I can't actually see what's happening this exposure is six hours, six hours. I never quite know you know where the moon is going to come from where it's going to end up it's all you know, guesswork um, based upon uh, experience. Um, and most of the ones, you know, the moon shot off the edge or it started somewhere else. It wasn't, didn't quite work. And this one worked out absolutely perfectly insofar as, the, you know, the moon just ended up right in the top corner. Um, it might, it is this, and, and you have to go and look at the print because it's mm. difficult to see. Yes. Is, is this an aeroplane's light? Winking? Yes, it's an aeroplane here. It's about, it's an aeroplane or a helicopter. Yeah, it's absolutely marvelous. Yes. So you must go and yeah. look at that and see the, the yeah. winking lights go, going through the picture. Um, There's something wonderful about photographing at night in so far as it is unpredictable. You can't actually sense what's going to happen over the next you know, four or five hours. Uh, sometimes you do get, you know, I've photographed uh, many night scenes and, and you get helicopters <coughs> and planes forming all sorts of strange lines. Mm. You know, as, 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 as the earth moves, of course, they leave star trails. Presumably there was, there was uh, a light cloud at some point and that's why this is misted here because the moon kind of dissipates a little bit. Mm. Um, and, you know, basically the tide has come up and gone down during that period of time. So right. you can see some islands. So, moving on, this is, this is another place that I, I just, I, you know, your work is all about atmosphere, mm. Michael. And mm -hmm. I, I actually Googled this place earlier just to, I thought I'd show an image of it. Yes. Uh -huh. you know, and, and, and actually, outside of your photography, it didn't look quite as exciting. 
Um, it, 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 you know, it's a beautiful building, but, but the, yes. the sort of the cold light of day photographs right. of it, mm -hmm. I didn't think were worth repeating. And, and it, it's, it's testimony to your photography mm -hmm. that you've made the whole thing sort of extra romantic and atmospheric mm -hmm. and exciting. But nevertheless, it's an extraordinary building. Can you tell us a little bit about this and what it is? Um, I, again, I came across this by... Uh, a good fortune, I'd been working with a press in San Francisco and they were doing a project on this, Le Desert de Rats. Um, this had been an abandoned estate uh, for many, many years. Uh, it was completely overgrown. Um, an architect named Olivier Chopin de Genvry, I believe, bought the estate for one franc in those days. In return uh, for his guarantee that he would completely restore it, uh, which he did over the following years. I was fortunate to get there in 1988, just when the restoration was starting, just when they were starting to, to clean the place up, and just when you could get in. And it felt as if there were, there were ghosts and presence, and it was kind of slightly haunted, and there was just a wonderful resonance of, of atmosphere. There was tension, there was, there was the patina of age, there was just a beautiful quality about the place. Um, and I spent um, many weeks, I would keep returning. Uh, I photographed continually. Um, it was a fascinating place. Um, and then they restored it. And I, you know, I came back the following years. And it's, it was fascinating to me, uh, something I already knew, that in the process of restoration, all the interest <coughs> somehow disappears. Um, you know, it's this wabi-sabi concept, you know, the idea of, of imperfection, the idea that things are not just so clean and perfect and wonderfully, it gets boring somehow. And so I was never really able to photograph it again. I mean, I went back and photographed, tried to photograph, kept trying to photograph. And it's, as you say, it's kind of not, it's like a museum now somehow. Yeah. It's, it's completely clean. You can go visit, but it doesn't have that, that, that atmosphere, that kind of walking back in time somehow. Yeah. Well, I think you've, you've captured it brilliantly there because uh, yeah, I felt the same looking today. And um, I just thought I'd, I'd you know, talk about the Lafitte pictures because, yeah. you know, I like all like wine and yes, yes, and, and I know you like yeah. wine. So it's, 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 yes, and, very much. And also, yeah. it's an interesting part of your work, and, mm -hmm. and you you still, despite being incredibly mm -hmm. successful and influential photographer, you still do a lot of commissions and, and so on and so forth. So I'd like to hear about this commission mm -hmm. and, and and what it was like to photograph this. Well, this that was an amazing <laughs> vineyard. Well, Chateau Lafitte, Baron Rothschild, um, he um, has commissioned a photographer, I think, for thirty five years now, each year to do his New Year's card. And this is not like a little card that we, you know, this is like a big three-piece card that has the whole history of the vintage that year, which presumably he sends out to all the people that collect his wine. And uh, there's a large audience. And so I, I essentially turned up on a Friday at, at four o'clock. I met the, the, you know, the chief uh, wine master who said, you know, here's a house. The fridge is full of food. Any, drink anything you want in the cellar. And, you know, we'll see you next week. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> And it, was, and it was absolutely great. I had complete carte blanche. I could wander anywhere I wanted around the estate, into the cellars, um, you know, and I got to taste some great wines. Yeah, what, 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 wine, what, wine did, what wine did they give you in your cellar? That was it. Uh, yeah. Well, the best one was a Chateau Lafitte 1995, which I Googled, and it was worth uh, 1,700 pounds at the wow. time. <laughs> but don't tell anyone about it. I took it home. Uh, but, but, but I did drink a lot of, a lot of good wine. Yeah, um, so most of the photographs came... They're still in focus, not all of them. So, <laughs> so I would literally go out at night and place cameras around the estate um, and photograph you know, these beautiful trees, <coughs> clouds, and the, the vines and so forth. And this particular photograph was actually made from the bathroom window of, uh, of where Baron Eric Rothschild lives. So he has his kind of castle up on the hill. And then down below, this was the old village of uh, Chateau Lafitte. Mm. Uh, and his, uh, his wife has a painting studio right here. <coughs> and uh, so that's what that is about. Wow. But yes, commissions are great when they happen. Yeah, yeah I love commissions. Okay. So I, I, I could pick pretty much any picture in this mm -hmm. show, but I thought I'd pick this one. Because um, I, I want to talk a little bit about your, your passion for and, and your appreciation of printing, mm. um, mm -hmm. darkroom printing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I know, that's, I know that it's a big part of your, your, your work, Perhaps you could just explain to everybody mm -hmm. why and, and, and how you came about mm -hmm. um, this, this, this particular kind of um, this passion. Mm. Um, well, printing is something I've, I've loved since, since day one, I think. Even when I was, uh, I was at school, I was in charge of, I mean, I was the, the head printer when letterpress printing. 
before photographic printing. Uh, but something about this is just kind of two-dimensional surfaces with, with, with lines, shapes, tonalities printed on it, it just drives me wild. Um, and so I've been very fortunate to have chosen a profession where I get basically everything that I want. I get to travel, which I absolutely love traveling. Um, I get to photograph at all times of day and night. I see interesting places, and I get to spend hours and hours on my own in a dark room, usually li listening to a book on tape or something. But, um, so I believe there are infinite variations that one can make in any scene. You know, you get a thousand photographers, they should come up with a thousand different photographs because we each have our own individual perception and imagination. And I believe it's the same in the printing process. Um, I could never give my negative to somebody else to print. I'm sure they would have a very good print, but it wouldn't be my print. It wouldn't be my interpretation. There is just so much you can do in the darkroom. And a lot of it is very, very subtle. Uh, but this particular image, you know, and it's interesting because this is a 2000 image. Uh, at the time, I printed three other variations, totally different photographs. I never printed this one. Uh, it was only when the book project came along and I was going through my negatives that I found this negative and printed it. And it's because on the contact sheet, it's, it's just completely soft and, and, and very calm and very gray. And it didn't look very interesting. But taking it into the darkroom and, and building up the contrast and, and you know, playing with these shapes down here and getting just enough tonality and working with these, these beautiful stormy clouds. Um, mm. But it's in the darkroom. You know, it's in the negative and it's in the darkroom. And even the original scene didn't look like this. You know, I just don't remember it in this kind of dynamic way. Uh, so you can create things in the darkroom, and, and, and it's, it, for me, it's an integral part of, of, of the whole photographic process. Yeah. And um, um, mm -hmm. my last question, before I, I see um, if you guys want to, um, to, to join in a bit, is if you were talking to uh, your 20-year-old self, mm -hmm. setting out as a photographer, and I really ask this in case there are any photographers here, young photographers looking for some, you know, a few tips, what, would you, what advice would you give yourself now that you've been doing it for I think you'd for, need for to work many um, years? 25 hours a day instead of 24. Yeah. Uh, it's basically, a lot of it is hard work. Um, I mean, I'm absolutely driven and passionate about this. You know, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm very, very fortunate, I understand. I have great appreciation for the fact that I somehow ended up in this profession that is so wonderful. Um, mm. But as a result, it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's consuming. Um, and as a photographer, you need to work all the time. Um, it's not something you can do on the weekend. It's not something you can do you know, now and again. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a way, it's a, it's a bit like playing a musical instrument, that you, know, you need to be on it all the time. You know, it takes years to get to the point where you don't even know it's a musical instrument. You can just you can play with your imagination. And photographically, it's the same. You, you get to the point where you don't, you don't think technically anymore. It's not even you have a camera, you have film, you have exposures and light mirrors, but you don't even, it just, it's just so, that goes away. You, you, you use your imagination, you, 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 you connect with your scene. I often say you have a conversation with what you're photographing. Uh, it becomes a kind of a, almost an existential experience in itself, regardless of all the equipment. Um, so I can have a conversation with a new person, and sometimes it's a bit predictable, sometimes it's exciting, you don't know what you're going to talk about. Um, but the conversations I really like to have are with the same person many, many times, people I've known for years and years and years. The conversation is deeper somehow. It's more intense. It kind of the roots are, are, are deeper, um, and so it becomes more interesting. There's a kind of a, a, a friendship. There's a relationship. There's a history. Uh, that is why I can keep going back to those places. Very much. This is in the mic. Right. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, yes, and just hang on to your wine glass. That's the key the point. Um, yes. Uh, I use Hasselblad for the most part. You can. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I also use Holger cameras, they're plastic. Yes, well, that's, you know, we're going to do that.